Near the end of World War I, Britain had developed and built the Hanley Page V-1500, a heavy bomber designed to be able to bomb Berlin. Though it would never get the chance to do so, the armistice being signed on the very day of its maiden mission, the development of the Hanley Page had spurred on others to design something even bigger. Enter Walter George Tarrant. He had founded WG Tarrant Limited. It was a well-known woodworking and building contractor based at Byfleet in Surrey. During the war, they had supplied numerous structural components to other aircraft manufacturers, and had patented a method of constructing wing spars that featured wooden lattice webs. In 1917, Tarrant wanted to move from producing aircraft components to building a complete aircraft himself. He took out a patent for latticed braced circular girders that would be used in large aircraft construction, and assembled a small design team. He was joined by Marcel Lebel, a Belgian aeronautical engineer, and W.H. Barling from the Royal Aircraft Factory. Together, they drew up the design for a very large four-engined biplane bomber towards the end of 1917. Initially, it was planned for the aircraft to be powered by four of the then-in-development 43.5-litre Sidley Tiger V-12 engines, which were expected to produce around 600 horsepower. However, it soon became evident that the Tiger engine was plagued by delays, and in fact it would ultimately be a complete failure, and so the decision was made to use six of the 450 horsepower Napier Lion engines instead. Due to this change in engine number, a third wing would be added to the aircraft, the central wing being of the widest span, and the upper and lower wings of smaller but equal span. In this new configuration, two pairs of tandem engines would be installed between the lower and middle wing, and two single engines would be mounted between the middle and the upper wing. The four tractor and two pusher engines would all drive two-blade fixed-pitch propellers. To support the added weight, additional centre section struts ran diagonally from the upper wing through the central wing before connecting to the central lower fuselage, in effect creating a huge, and hopefully very strong, Warren truss. Strength would definitely be needed, for not only was Tarrant's aircraft now going to be exceedingly tall, but it was still designed to carry a very heavy bomb load. No exact figure was given for a maximum total bomb load, but the designers had intended for it to carry approximately 20 230-pound bombs, so based off that it would have a total payload capacity of around 4,600 pounds. The bombs themselves would have been carried under the central wing section of the lower wing. Due to the truss structure connecting the wings, this heavy load would be spread throughout the entire wing structure rather than putting all of it just on the lower wing and the fuselage. The fuselage itself looked very sleek and modern for the time, thanks to Tarrant's patented design method. It was a streamlined monocoque, constructed of lattice-webbed circular fuselage frames, and covered with 2-4mm of ply. Attached to the rear of the fuselage was a traditional biplane tail unit. It comprised of two tailplanes, the lower of which had a horn-balanced elevator, and the upper had a trimming surface that could be operated by a handwheel in the cockpit. A second elevator was mounted in the tailplane gap, but I cannot find evidence as to whether this had a balancing horn like the lower one did. It would not surprise me, as pitch stability was of prime concern when designing the aircraft, especially after adding the additional two engines so high above its centre of gravity. The aircraft would be supported by two massive undercarriage structures. Each of these carried a trio of five-foot diameter wheels that were mounted on a common axle. Each wheel assembly was attached by struts directly beneath the engine that mounted the interplane struts. As such, the impact from landing was distributed between the three wings and their support structures. To increase stability on landing and ground handling, the landing gear had a very wide track of over 31 feet. At one point, it seems that the construction of the aircraft was halted, though this cannot be completely verified. Some news article snippets from 1919 and 1920 claim that construction paused after the end of the First World War, but many other sources mention nothing of the kind. Either way, it seems that the construction of the aircraft was completed around the middle of spring 1919. Due to the considerable height of the aircraft, it was decided to complete its final assembly in a huge balloon shed at Farnborough with the finished aircraft being moved in and out of the hangar sideways on a specially built pair of railway tracks. 
Tarrant's prototype bomber was complete by May of 1919, and it was given the serial designation F-1765. To a public onlooker at the time, it must have looked almost ridiculously big. The aircraft had a maximum wingspan of 131 feet 3 inches, a length of 73 feet 2 inches, and a considerable height of 37 feet 3 inches. For comparison, that makes it taller but shorter than the Caproni 90, which was the largest biplane ever built. The aircraft had been completed to accommodate a crew of six, which included two pilots. However, no record shows of any designed gunner emplacements, though it can be assumed that one would be in charge of bomb aiming, and at least another would be an engineer of sorts to manage the six engines. The cockpit was open, and the rest of the crew could access the fuselage by a pair of hatches below the nose. For reasons that were about to become painfully obvious, no performance statistics were ever recorded. But the Tabor was wind tunnel tested by both the Royal Aircraft Establishment and the National Physics Laboratory. It was estimated to have a maximum speed of just over 110 miles an hour, a surface ceiling of 13,000 feet, and an endurance of approximately 12 hours. Unfortunately, the reports of these two authorities conflicted, something not ideal when you're trying to find out if your new expensive prototype will fly or not, with the RAE suggesting that the aircraft was excessively tail-heavy, and the physics laboratory suggesting otherwise. A proposal was put forward to add 1,000 pounds of lead ballast into the nose to counteract this supposed heavy tail, but Tarrant strongly disagreed with this, believing that the RAE report to be incorrect. However, the ballast was added anyway, though it is not clearly known whether Tarrant or the two test pilots assigned to the aircraft were ever made aware of this decision. On the 26th of May 1919, the aircraft was made ready for its maiden flight. At the controls were Captains F.G. Dunn and P.T. Rawlings, who were accompanied by four crewmen. After completing the lengthy process of starting the six engines, which required the use of a large gantry and perhaps the largest Hux starter ever built, Dunn carried out a number of trial taxiing runs before starting his takeoff run. To begin with, he opened up the four tandem engines mounted between the lower wings, and when the aircraft was at sufficient speeds to lift the tail, he opened up the two upper engines as well. At this point, witnesses saw the aircraft tip over onto its nose, its undercarriage collapsing, and coming to rest tail up with the front of the nose and the fuselage completely crushed. Immediately following the crash, a catastrophic fire was avoided by the quick thinking of either one of the pilots or the crew who engaged the master cutoff switch. Unfortunately, both of the pilots would succumb to their injuries, but the rest of the crew escaped, with the only major injury being a broken leg sustained by one Captain T.M. Wilson, who was flung through the rear section of the fuselage on impact. A subsequent investigation would conclude that the direct cause of the accident was the sudden increase of thrust by the upper pair of engines, which caused the aircraft to violently pitch over. These engines were mounted 28 feet in the air, and it was strongly suspected that the 1,000 pounds of nose ballast was unknown to the pilots, otherwise they would never have applied so much power, especially as the aircraft was running a light load with minimal fuel and no simulated bomb load. A second aircraft had been planned, possibly as an attempt to develop the Tabor into a commercial aircraft in the new post-war era, but it would never be built. It was deemed inherently unstable, and the only way of rectifying it, which included removing the upper wing and engines and replacing the four main engines with more powerful ones, was too expensive to justify. And so the Tabor would become WG Tarrant's first and only foray into aircraft design. No surviving parts of the aircraft survive today, but it certainly serves as an example that bigger is not always better. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed today's video. Thank you all so much for watching, and I shall catch you all next time. Goodbye.